Hey guys, Matt here, Rex Brewery. Happy Humber Wednesday. Couldn't wait. This is a first pour, first sample um, after kegging the Blonde Ale. So this is my first beer doing a, a pressure fermentation. Um, you know, the process went pretty good overall. I learned some things along the way. And uh, thank you, Dennis, for your advice uh, with fermenting in a keg, because that's also new to me. I've never fermented in a keg before. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's it's come out nice. Uh, it is very young, of course. It's only been, uh, it's you know, I brewed it last week, so it's only been, it's actually been seven days, because I brewed it, I believe, last Thursday. So um, yeah, so we had three days of cold crashing. The fermentation went really fast. It was done in under 48 hours. So I just gave it uh, sort of a diacetyl rest, a little bit of a, a time to kind of chill out for a couple of days before I did the cold crash. Um, and I did that just because of the yeast that I used. I, I, I've had experience with the Southern German lager yeast, um, but I did ferment it in ale temperatures, so it's probably not that big of a deal. But I just wanted to make sure to drive off any diacetyl that might've been there. It smells pretty good. It's definitely, uh, definitely young. Um, doesn't have a whole lot of like hop character or uh, multi character, really. It's probably all the yeast I'm smelling. Uh, this was only supposed to get down to 1013 and actually got down to 1006. But right, let's see, cheers. Uh, it's pretty good. It's a pretty basic beer. There's not a whole lot of uh, fanciness to this. Yeah, I'm definitely picking up what I expected to pick up here from what I added. Uh, the base grain that was in this is Maris Otter, so a little bit more of a sort of a multi um, character to that, which is what I was going for. I put in some carapils, a half a pound of carapils, a half a pound of torrified wheat. Um, I've had good success with that to kind of help with uh, head retention and some clarity. Um, and a half a pound of Gold Pills Vienna. I did that to try to get, see if I can get, pull out a little bit of that sort of graham crackery taste that comes from that malt. Because I plan on putting that in my uh, apple cinnamon wheat um, and make a proper apple pie beer. Um, yeah, I think I got some of that character in this. But it's obviously not fully carbonated. I mean, there's some bubbles in there and it's, um, it's maybe halfway clear. I don't expect this beer to get become super clear. Um, but that, that turned out good. I, you know, one of the things that I was concerned with was, um, you know, coming out of the keg, I didn't know if how, how the, uh, the dip tube, um, and the, you know, the clarity and this sort of getting out, filtering anything out of that yeast cake would be, uh, any type of issue, but I'll say that it worked out good. I cut two inches off the dip tube and, um, and get our first look in here. So I'm definitely gonna have to give the keg a thorough cleaning now that it's actually going through fermenting in the keg. The downside with this is I've come to find is um, probably I'm gonna be able to harvest this use very easily. So that's the one downside I guess of this. Yeah, it's still pretty, uh, the cake is down there at the bottom. There's still a little bit of beer left over that didn't reach the uh, dip tube. Let me see if I can get that on the camera. I don't know if I can. I don't know if you can see in there, probably not. So that worked out pretty good. Plenty of head space. I put four and a half gallon, or four and a quarter of gallons in there. So that worked out all right. Um, gonna make a bit of an improvement though. Um, another suggestion that I had got was to try this thing out. It's called Float, Float It 2.0. It's a floating dip tube. So I ordered this um, after I had started that. And I know I probably should have, you know, maybe tried that a couple times, but you know, I saw a, a fancy gadget, it wasn't that expensive. I think I paid, gee, I don't remember now if it was maybe 15 bucks, 20 bucks, it wasn't a lot. Um, comes with a couple, like, looks like extra gaskets. Um, this is the floating dip tube assembly, the, the filtering piece, which looks very similar to the, um, the bouncer. Um, and then of course the tube goes on the end of here and, and then the only other end of it is the small stainless steel dip tube that goes into the keg to replace the actual dip tube. Um, looks pretty easy to, um, to work with, uh, pretty easy to probably take apart and clean. Um, this thing just has sort of a spring loaded uh, end on it that you kind of, hopefully, you know, not poking yourself, just open up like this, and pull it out of there. And you can rinse this out and it's really just a, looks like it's just a weight. It, it's not open except for just the, uh, the one port there. And then, you know, the spring loaded filter here Take that apart. Here's the gaskets. So you get the extra ones. Take you can take all this apart, and I guess I guess if you wanted to, you could replace this with a finer 
um, mesh if you needed to or a coarser depending on the situation. But um, as it is, it looks like it'll work pretty well. So I think I'm going to give this a try the next time I do a pressure fermentation. And we'll see if that improves it, any of the process at all. But that worked out pretty good. I, you know, as you can see right here, this is, this is uh, freshly transferred tonight. And uh, there is nothing in there. That's pretty clear. So maybe with a more hoppy beer, um, that'd be more of an issue if there's more crud at the bottom. But for this one with that yeast, that worked out okay. Um, and this spunding valve contraption worked the treat. Uh, the only thing I had to do with it was I had to adjust it a number of times uh, because it kept climbing up above 15. And I was just afraid of having too much pressure in there. So I just kept backing it off, backing it off until it leveled out at about 11 or 12. Um, so this beer ferment, pretty much fermented at a, at a fairly consistent 11 or 12 PSI and it turned out good. Um, so I look forward to doing more pressure fermenting and, and just trying and getting better at that process. It seems like a cool thing to do for these type of beers, the lighter beers, the maybe the more hoppy beers. Um, I don't know if I would do it with every beer, but because um, I do have my SS Brewtech brew bucket and uh, that works great for uh, for pretty much everything anyway. I just can't pressure ferment in it. Um, what else can I say about this beer? Um, not a whole lot. I mean, I pretty much kept the uh, the, the water profile uh, pretty even keel. Uh, nothing fancy there either. I do have plenty of brew day footage that I want to tack on to the end of this video for you guys to check out. Um, it's a few minutes of that, so I don't want to you know, talk for much longer because there's probably might be eight, ten minutes or something like that of, of that. Um, I did enter... Uh, into the national homebrew competition um, for the just just to get into it again. I, I did it a couple years ago, and I, I love to see the judges' feedback. So that's the main reason I'm doing it. Not necessarily trying to win anything. That would be nice, but I, I'm more after the feedback. I really like how that apple cinnamon wheat turned out. I'm probably going to rebrew it um, if I have enough time before uh, we have to submit our beers, just to kind of critique it a little bit more with that gold pills Vienna. We get that kind of graham cracker. Uh, portion in with the apples and cinnamon um, but I did submit that beer uh, and I'm gonna you know we'll see how it does you know if, if nothing else I'll get some good feedback from the judges and I would love to just see what they say I did put a couple orders into our sponsors um, so I'm expecting to get something back uh, um, just one to support them mainly but also uh, just looking to try some new things so I ordered some stuff from beer and wine hobby and I ordered some stuff from Yakima Valley so I'm looking forward to that when those come in, I'll put a video for that. Um, but that's all I really have for you guys this week. Enjoy the brew day footage. We'll see you next week. Cheers. I know this isn't much, but it, it's uh, it's coming along. I'll we'll have a proper pour hopefully next week. So uh, have a good night, everybody. Take care. A little better shot with the light. There's the Krausen. Plenty of plenty of room there. Nice little yeast cake back down there. Got to got to rescue the tilt as well. Okay, it's another brew day. Second one of 2023. Trying to come up to that mash temp. I just added the grains. Kind of did the same thing as I did the last time. I put the water in both vessels and heated them both up together. Mash water and the uh, HLT. Um, there's a storm coming tonight, so I'm trying to get this going. And uh, generally, start to finish about four hours. Um, depending on how long I need for cleanup, but sometimes a little over. So trying to get this all done before that happens. But we're mashing in. This is going to be a blonde ale. All right, getting the, uh, getting the hops ready. Mash is almost done, so we'll be sparging soon. But I just want to make sure that uh, we had everything, so I don't have to do any last minute changes. But um, these are just some leftovers I've had from uh, 2021. I'm pretty sure all these are from the same time frame. Uh, this, I'm going to do a quarter ounce of Challenger in for bittering at the beginning. These are from Yakima Valley Hops, so props to our BrewTuber sponsor, Yakima Valley Hops. Um, just the uh, leftover of what I had from, from that, from another beer. Um, got some EKG uh, from Yakima Chief, which is a former sponsor um, for one of our uh, yeast, or maybe it was one of our, uh, it was definitely one of our experiments, but I don't remember which one now. Um, off the top of my head, might have been, might have been the malt experiment actually. Um, and then some Tetanang, this is from Austin Homebrew. I think I ordered a kit from them for something a couple years back. So these, just using up the leftovers I have of this stuff. It's kind of been the theme so far, uh, the last couple of brews, just to try to eat up some of the 
ingredients have been kind of sitting on for a couple of years and uh, make way for some new stuff. So now we are sparging. Got that nice clear work going in there. Got a nice golden color to it. All right, good thing I measured these out because the Challenger was not a quarter of an ounce, it was a half an ounce. So now it's a quarter of an ounce. <laughs> Got it for something else. But uh, yeah, not taking any chances this time with that uh, chiller. So back to the hop spider as we were before. We got the boil going. Put those in. Start the timer, 60 minutes. And now we just wait all the way to 15 to put in everything else. Now we're at the 15 minute mark. Go ahead and add in the rest of the hops. This is the uh, EKG and Tetanang. That goes in the hop spider. And then we got the yeast nutrient and the whirl flock tablet, which will go in the kettle. All right, with just a few minutes left on the boil, this is where I like to uh, start sanitizing the chiller. I don't have the water on yet, of course. It's also a good opportunity to get the get those air bubbles out of the lines so they can boil, boil through. Turn on that pump. Start that, get that circulation going there. And that's flame out. Now we're already, we're already boiled pulling, so now we can go ahead and turn on the chilling water. And away we go. All right, filling up the keg. Took a refractometer reading. It's 1045. It's aiming for 1048. That's pretty close. It does have some wheat in there. Maybe the maybe the wheat didn't crush as well as it should have. But that'll be fine. We do want it to be a low ABV beer anyhow. Yeah, I guess it's about four gallons or so. That'll be fine. And then goes our yeast. And then in the tilt. First time using a tilt in a keg. Should be interesting. Put our spunding valve contraption. And uh Hopefully that is actually going to be set to 10. We'll see what happens after it starts fermenting. Close that valve. All right, there it is in the ferment chamber. It does get cold here a little bit in the morning still, so I did put the heating valve on there. It doesn't close all the way. Um, so hopefully enough of that is touching that to make a difference. I'll have to monitor it over the course of the uh, next couple of days, but we have, the, have it set to 66. And, um, yeah, we will see how we do. Well, this is the next morning, so it's been fermenting for maybe 10 hours. And maybe it's time to dial this back a little. All right, so it's been 24 hours and uh, been playing around with the spunding valve just to get this set properly a lot of ups and downs to get it to be uh pretty consistent here i kept climbing up above 15 and i had to keep backing it off degassing the the keg and trying again and i think it's finally settled on this 11 psi which is right in the range that i was after between 10 to 12 based on some feedback i've gotten from a few folks and i don't know if you can hear that but it is hissing so it's letting out the remaining gas that's over that amount. And uh, just gonna keep an eye on this to make sure it still stays there, but it seems to be doing okay. I mean, it would have moved by now. It, this is not a very quick process, but it definitely would have been quicker than a couple of hours. This would have moved again. Yeah, I think we're good. And then the nice thing about this is it's sort of a set it and forget it. You know, barring that any kids get a hold of this and play with the knob, I should be able to ferment the next thing as it stands and uh, not have to mess with this again.